Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming to this talk on non-domestic retrofit pathways to NZEB and ZEB. My name is Eamon Shields. I'm Program Manager for Commercial Retrofit. And um, I think you can see from the crowd here today that everyone's very conscious of this topic and the retrofit, especially the non-domestic market, is something that we're really eager to tackle in SEAI, and that's really the sole purpose of my role, so no pressure there, obviously. Um, so we have a range of speakers from all facets, from the regulatory side, the architectural, the M&E, and then the next stage as well, which is really the controls and the analytics side, which is a hugely important element, especially for the non-domestic sector, which SEII are really conscious that we need to start tapping into, and that's even been demonstrated in some of the additions to the CAP 23, which came out there a few months ago. But I suppose, just to give a kind of a rough idea, I was trying to think of a way, I suppose, to give a sense that society has really taken on the ideas that we need to harness all our abilities and all our different options to reach our goal that we need to reach. And I suppose the simplest way, I actually seen something when I was going shopping for my daughter there at the weekend. Uh, I, was, I was looking for this book and uh, that was the first option and this was the second option. Neither of them were available, but within that actual bookshop in the section where you would find these, I did find this book which is a ladybird book for climate change. Now, anyone who's aware of the ladybird series, it's not the most revolutionary or groundbreaking series of books, so I think it's a really good example of the fact of how embedded this is now in our society. And just to give you a sense, and these books that I'm gonna show you now aren't to offend anyone, obviously it's from a, diff a, di a much different time, but just to give you a sense of the kind of stuff that ladybird books used to talk about, was helping at home and shopping with mother. Now, there's obviously huge issues with both them books, but I'm not gonna talk about, but just to give you a sense, it's only the very conventional things that these books deal with. So the fact that it's embedded in there, and actually the, the book itself, the Climate Change book, is co-authored by uh, a monarch formerly known as Prince Charles. Um, so that's really interesting. And, just if anyone's interested, there's some other interesting ladyboard books out here at the moment. <laughs> the Hangover and the Shed, so <laughs> you can still, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of area that the climate change is sharing, so you know, so it's a very basic, you know, idea now, which is really great to see. So, um, and just for everyone, just to finish the circle, anyone who's worried, this book came out uh, last month, Little Miss Waste Less, so that's probably what I get for my daughter for her birthday. So anyway, on to the point of, the conversation today. The agenda, um, so obviously I'm gonna do a very brief introduction. There'll be no more random little miss titles coming up. And uh, Georgina Malloy from SEAI is gonna be talking about the EPV update, which is hugely important, obviously, and is gonna drive all the changes to Partel and everything else on the regulatory side, which in reality is a huge element of what's gonna drive the non-domestic non retrofit and new build, obviously. Um, we've got Helena McAllellum, nearly got there, I'm sorry, uh, from IRAI, and she's going to talk about the climate challenge. And then we've got Shawnee Griffin, which was a surprise edition, but a really welcome edition. Shawnee's going to talk about the, the new climate change data that is coming out, which is Irish-related data for the use in overheating calculations which is a really important addition. And I think generally speaking, it's a, it's a positive change for anyone out there who's doing those calculations. Um, and then David Walsh is gonna talk about some of the stuff he's doing in conjunction with SEAI in terms of just looking at the different impact of different uh, systems and different approaches to uh, the retrofit of commercial buildings. And it's some really interesting information in there. It's not fully finished, but it'll give you a, a sense of some of the stuff we found. And then to finish off, We've got Tom Asko, last but not least, and this is a really interesting um, presentation. And it's all about the whole smart building technology and the ability to do things with what's already existing there and possibly use analytics on top of it. But 
I'm not going to get into it as if I understood it, but it is really impressive stuff. And in terms of capital cost, it's, it's so small compared to some of the other conventional methods. So lastly, I'm just going to, I suppose, give you a sense of the rapid pace of movement, I suppose, that SEAI in conjunction with the government are constantly looking at ways and taking on new ideas in terms of how we can deal with the impact and to take on every potential route that we have and every potential tool. So if you look at CAP21, so some of the basic things around commercial retrofit was just talking about removal of fossil fuels. And then there was this heavy sense of, you know, 50,000 buildings to get um, zero carbon heating. And then there was a, an element of district heating. But if you even take the change from 21 to 23, the target now, as opposed to being talking about like, you know, 50,000 buildings and zero carbon heating, it's talking about actual reduction in CO2, which now opens us up to the whole gamut of possibilities of what we can use to get to that target. So it's not shoehorning us or pinning us into an idea of like it did in 20, uh, 2019 cap where they talked about 25,000 heat pumps. Now it's, then it was talking about zero carbon heating, but now we're talking about we just need to get that reduction. So it's open to all the things and like some of the stuff you'll hear today. So it's all, it also talks about promoting and supporting building automation and control optimization, smart building technologies to increase energy efficiency and monitoring, which again is a hugely important thing and real low hanging fruit. And also talks about the upgrade of existing building energy management systems to high efficiency and zero carbon equivalent. So again, all the things such as pumps, fans, air handling units, all them other things that are in the building that aren't directly associated with heat. All of these things are huge energy users and things we should use. So you can see there the, the dynamic sense that's going on within SEI and in the government to get us where we need to get to. And I think some of these discussions here today will, will uh, demonstrate that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to let Georgina come up and give you a brief outline of the proposed EPBD. Thanks, Eamon. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the energy show so far and you've had a chance to look around. Um, I'm delighted to see so many people here. There is a few seats at the front. If anyone does want to sit down, please feel free to come up um, and have a seat. Um, so, as Eamon said, my name is Georgina Malloy. I am the uh, Programme Manager for EPBD, which is Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, Concerted Action and Implementation. And I was in early to get a parking space this morning. I was talking to the Head of Communications with SEAI, and he said, we don't use acronyms. And I said, well, the first talk that I'm given today is at the ends, pathways to NZEB and ZEB. So, um, you know, as Eamon was saying, we need to expand our language so that, you know, um, more than just the industry can, can understand what we're talking about. Um, so I'm a chartered engineer. I've been working as an engineer for 22 years. I've worked in consulting design, in contracting, and now most recently for SEAI. So I've seen the industry from various different angles. Um, so the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, what is it? Um, what will it mean for our business, your business, and the sector in general? Um, just to get a show of hands, um, is anyone in the room kind of aware of the EPBD or in general? It's okay if you're not. Okay, so a good few people. Even if you're not aware of it, it will affect your business, you know, because it trickles down to the legislation, the climate action plan, and the building regulations. So. Um, Delighted to see some people here aware of it. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll talk about the history of the EPBD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, and concerted action and what they are. I'll talk about the current status of the directive and the uh, revisions to it that we expect later this year. I'll touch on what it might mean for our business and the sector in general, and then probably at the end, um, I'll stay around so there'll be, there'll be time for discussion and chat. So the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is an EU directive and it was first published in 2002 and the aim 
um, was to improve the energy performance of the European building stock. Um, so because it's an EU directive, it has to be transposed into Irish law, and the, the rules and the mandates for buildings then get put into the building regulations. So the most applicable to us would be part L, conservation of fuel and energy, and part F, ventilation. I'm sure you're all aware of those. Um, and then the 27 EU member states, all the other countries, transpose it into their laws. So the 2002 publication brought the um, EPCs, Energy per Performance Certificates, which is what we know as building energy ratings, so BERs, and they were first brought with the EPBD, and also the requirement for BERs to have an advisory report, um, which is very applicable to this talk because the advisory report um, triggers renovation and gets people who get a BER to think about how you might improve your building. So the directive was revised in 2010 and 2018. And in 2018, we saw the mandate for new buildings to be NZ, nearly zero energy buildings. So um, what's a nearly zero energy building? I'm sure many of you have been designing them since 2018 and well before. Um, so it's a building that requires a very low amount of energy. So it has, it's a high performance building. It requires a very low amount of energy. And the amount of energy that it does require should be covered to a very significant extent, extent by energy from renewable sources. So renewable sources on site or nearby. Nearby meaning a district heating scheme. The 2018 revision also saw a mandate for major renovations. So a major renovation is when more than 25% of the building fabric or the building facade is being renovated. So when your renovation is called a major renovation, there's mandates in the building regulations and rules that you need to follow. Um, so for a domestic renovation, generally that would be to get the building to a B2 or a cost optimal equivalent. And for a non-domestic building, there's various different um, rules laid out in the building regulations, depending on what type of building you have. Um, in 2018, we also made a major revision to the advisory report part of the BER. Um, and that really was to promote and trigger renovation. So not everyone who gets a BER is planning a renovation. You might get a BER to sell the building or rent the building, but everyone who gets a BER gets an advisory report. The idea is to get people thinking about renovation. And when you see the advisory report, you think, okay, this is the next step I could take to, to make my building more efficient. So that's a sample of a BER um, certificate. And that's an example of the first page of a non-domestic advisory report. So it gives a list of things that you might consider doing to um, renovate your building. And I'll talk about how the EPBD is going to improve on this. So the EPBD really has driven the BER um, program in Ireland. We currently have nearly 750 domestic BER assessors registered. We have 210 non-domestic BER assessors. There's a strong demand for BER assessor training at the moment, and we have four training companies registered. So even if you weren't, I mean, a lot of you maybe have done the course, and if you, even if you weren't thinking of being a BER assessor, it's handy to know what's, what is required. Uh, so over 4,000 BERs were added to the public register last year. And we expect that a high amount of BERs in the coming years will be linked to retrofit. So what's the current status of the EPBD? Will we expect a revision to the text um, in June of this year? And the aim is to increase renovation rates and to ultimately have a decarbonized building stock by 2050. Um, so the mandates coming in the revision will be implemented over the next number of years. So what's the motivation for the revision? Well, I've taken some of these statistics from the European Commission website, and uh, you might not think that the website's, uh, you know, an easy, often European legislation is not easy to read, but the website's actually a pretty handy place to go if you just put in EPBD European Commission. Um, it does have some good overviews even if you don't go into the texts and the documents. So they say that buildings in Europe account for 40% of energy consumed, that buildings account for 36% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions, 
that 75% of EU buildings are not energy efficient, and that nearly 95% of EU buildings will still be standing in 2050. So how does Ireland compare to that? Ireland's buildings account for 42% of energy consumed. So we're up there and beyond the average in Europe. And across Europe, currently, 1% of the building stock is being renovated every year. So if you think that 95% of our buildings will still be standing, we really need to ramp up these renovation rates um, if we're going to meet our targets. So I said at the start that I'm the Programme Manager for EPBD Concerted Action. So what's that? Well, Concerted Action is an EU-funded programme where um, the 27 EU member states and the European Commission come together to exchange knowledge, information, um, and best practice on how to implement the mandates of the directive. So we meet a couple of times a year to exchange, you know, how we're getting on, how we're implementing it. And of the 27 countries, eight countries have a management role. So the eight countries set the agenda, decide on the topics to be discussed, and organize the, the meetings. And Ireland is one of those management of eight, and I'm the team leader for the Irish um, management team. So really, from the very start, we've worked with the European partners, and it's about sharing knowledge, learning from different countries, and um, passing, up, passing back you know, what we're doing in Ireland to, um, to drive what we want to achieve. So what do we expect in the revision? And that's, you know, how is it going to Im impact what you need to do in terms of renovation and um, decarbonizing? So we expect the introduction of building renovation passports. I don't know, has anyone heard of, of the, the concept of a building renovation passport yet? Um, so in the next year or two, we'll see the introduction of these through the directive. So it's a tool to plot and manage the renovation of a building. Um, and it's a pathway that will show you how to get the building you have today to being a zero emissions building. And it will set out a number of steps, um, you know, logical sequence steps that you could take. And um, it will be voluntary for building owners. So it will be compulsory for countries to provide the system. So if you want a building renovation passport, you can get one, but it won't be mandatory, at least initially anyway. Um, and the idea is that the building renovation passport, much like the BER, will move with the building. So if you sell your building, the new owner can see the passport and see, OK, the previous owner carried out step one and two. And now I can see that step three is, we'll say, solar on the roof. So this is the next step that I need to look for funding to do. Um, and that the previous owner hasn't done something that's kind of going to prevent me from doing what I need to do. Um, and it'll, you know, it'll help um, to track progress in each country across Europe. We expect the introduction of digital building logbooks. So this is a common repository for energy performance data. Um, things like the BER, the renovation passport, so that all of the building performance data is kept in one place. And it'll help to track renovation and monitor progress across Ireland and across Europe. So I spoke a moment ago about the fact that the building renovation passport will tell a building owner how to get their building from where it is today to being a zero emissions building. So what's a zero emissions building? At the moment, we're designing new buildings to be nearly zero energy buildings. Now we have zero emissions buildings. So we'll see this introduction over the next four years or so. So a zero emissions building is a building that has a very high energy performance that requires a very low amount of energy, and the amount of energy that it does require should come from renewable sources generated on site or nearby, so on site, on the roof or whatever, and or from district heating. And there should be no fossil fuels on site. Um, so that's the concept and the detail of how that's implemented will be worked out um, you know, as we see the text and as we discuss it at concerted action. So they've, they've, um, they've yet to define the word deep renovation in EU legislation, and we'll see that come out as the text gets published, but the current text that we have says that a deep renovation is a renovation that will transform a building into being a nearly zero energy building from now up until 2030, and then after 2030, a deep renovation should transform a building into being a zero emissions building. 
We expect the harmonization of the BER scale uh, in the next two or three years. So on the left, you can see the scale that we have today. So we have A1, A2, A3, and so on. On the right, we have the scale that's proposed. So the proposal is that every country in Europe will have the same scale. Um, and it will be a scale from A to G, A being a zero emissions building, and G being the worst performing 15% of buildings in the country. Um, so the idea is it would be more in line with the energy labelling of um, appliances, and the common scale across Europe will allow us to kind of monitor how countries are doing in getting their worst performing buildings and improving them. So as I said there, an A would be a zero emissions building and a G would be the worst performing buildings. And between that, then we'd have even bandwidths of B to F. So following on from that, um, we expect the introduction of en uh, minimum energy performance standards. So this will be gradually introduced beginning in the next four years or so. And this is to trigger the renovation of the worst performing buildings and to increase rates of renovation. So if we take the worst performing 15% and they go into the G category, the mandates is that those buildings would need to be improved to being an F. And then eventually they'll have to be improved up and up so that all of the Gs are gone and we gradually increase uh, the performance of our building stock. So alongside the EPBD, the European Commission published their EU Solar Energy Strategy. Um, it was published last year and it was a, a, a direct response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the, the need to get away from, for Europe to get away from Russian gas and fossil fuels in general. So it was broken into three, um, three sections, and there's a good summary on the, the European Commission website. I've put a, a link there, but um, it was a nice summary to read. One is the European Solar Rooftop Initiative, two is the EU Large Scale Skills Partnership, and three is the Solar PV Industry Alliance. And number one there is the one that sits into the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. And it's, it's the concept that Europe would like to take as much advantage of roof, rooftops as they can to generate, um, to generate energy. Um, the skills partnership, look, we all know the skills shortage that we have, and that's not, uh, that's not unique to Ireland. Every country in Europe is suffering from um, a, skill, a lack of skilled labour force. So this is an initiative to try and, and tackle that and to try to bring manufacturing of re uh, renewables back to Europe. Um, and when we talk about global warming potential and air miles and all of that, that's going to be very, very important. Um, so what does it mean for business and the sector in general? Well, it's likely to drive demand for renovation and renewables, which will in turn put pressure on supply chains. So I've talked about the, the skills shortage, the, the, the shortage of professionals to design these buildings, um, pressure on supply chain of materials, so materials with low embodied carbon, um, where they're being manufactured, are they being manufactured close to where they're being used, so that'll put pressure on supply chains, and then manufacture of renewables. And then in turn, demand on fi for finance and funding. Um, so how, how are we going to fund all of this? So I would say um, for, your, for yourselves to keep up to date with these revisions, we expect it in June. So keep an eye, follow us on LinkedIn and all of the other platforms, watch our website and gov.ie, the Department of Housing will be involved in changing the building regulations. So watch uh, for their press releases as well. Um, so thank you so much for listening and um, I hope you have a great day and we'll, I'll be around to talk later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Georgina. That's really interesting. And I suppose, as you can see from Georgina's presentation there, there probably is a a slight bit of false advertising there in the title. Obviously, what NZEB and ZEB become once this uh, new EPBD is released in June is still up for debate at the moment. There's obviously been an update or a, a slight tease there in March of 23 in regard to what some of the elements um, may be in the new EPBD uh, following the, the, the initial draft that was shown in December 21. But again, it's important to say that at the moment, we really don't know exactly what's going to be finally agreed. Um, so I think it's important to say as well, I suppose we're leaving SEAI waters now in terms of uh, speakers. So uh, 
obviously everybody here is an expert in their field. If there was full agreement between SEII and everybody in the field, uh, you'd get a sense that there was just somebody there who didn't care, so they were just following along with everyone else. So not to say that everything that's discussed from this point on <laughs> is exactly um, the way we look at it. I'm not saying that it won't be, but uh, I'm just, just uh, putting a bit of a health warning on it from, from our point of view. Um, so, uh, Helena, if you'd like to come up, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks for the disclaimer there. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Helena McElmeal. I'm an architect based in private practice in Galway, um, but I'm also chairperson of the RAI Sustainability Task Force, and I'm here with that hot hat on today. Um, Try again. <laughs> no. Okay. Bear with me. Sorry, guys. I think I'm here. Right. Okay, I'll be in, so We're back to the beginning. Oh, the sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Would you maybe? Sorry. sorry apologies there. Thanks very much. Okay, right. Take two. Right. So, um, I suppose if just to just to a quick um, introduction to the RAI and um, the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland. I suppose the regulatory body in relation to the architecture prof um, profession in Ireland and the competent authority for architecture in Ireland. I am the Sustainability Task Force sits under the Practice Committee within the RAI and we support members and the profession in relation to the implementation of more sustainable building. Um, in Ireland and the membership of the RAI. Um, the work of the task force over the last few years has had a particular, we're, we've been working through a series of guides or documentation to, I suppose, embed sustainability within the RAI and the profession in Ireland. So I suppose a document, um, the sustainability for the current global environmental crisis is the RAI sustainability policy, which was issued about three or four years ago. So that, um, I suppose, outlines and embeds how the RAI and in its practice and um, at the UN Sustainable Development Goals are embedded in its operations and how um, in its business, I suppose, is the Institute. The RAI Sustainable Design Pathways, again, these three documents are, are led and prepared by the RAI Sustainability Task Force. So the second document outlines, it's a guide for members and architects in terms of how to implement and design and deliver more sustainable buildings and be more sustainable in their, in their practice and business. And then finally, the one I'm here to, to um, uh, talk about today is the RIAI Climate Challenge. This document was issued approximately 18 months ago, and it looks at, it sets, it's a voluntary standard effectively, or an initiative to encourage better building now, in terms of the kind of buildings that we need to be delivering by 2030, and sets out particular targets by building type, um, and encouraging members, commissioning members of the institute or architectural profession, design teams, clients, and, and um, commissioning bodies to just try harder now and to, to, to I suppose, to reduce the, the carbon, the environmental, um, the biodiversity impact of um, the buildings that we're delivering while still maintaining, uh, striving for very high levels of, I suppose, beauty and comfort and, and health and well being in the buildings we're delivering. So um, I suppose just to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues in the RAI task force who um, oversaw the production of this document. And again, the, the help of the RIBA, um, RIBA in terms of their support. Again, a lot of the, uh, the base work for this was um, undertaken by them through part of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects Climate Challenge issued a few years back. 
So I suppose Georgina does a great job at setting out the context. The figures might vary by 1% perhaps, but um, I suppose we're getting 36 in EU average, 37 perhaps in Ireland according to the Irish Green Building Council in terms of the impact of our buildings and as a profession, our responsibilities under that. Um, and again, the breakup of that, 23% relating to the operational carbon, which Georgina talked a lot about in her presentation, and 14% of that relating to the embodied carbon, so that's the, the carbon associated with the, the, the building materials effectively, the plant, the, 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 the things assembled to create the buildings, um, which then consume that operational carbon. So the why has been, Georgina's covered a lot, um, go back on um, the Environmental Performance of Buildings Directive, but I suppose a takeaway from that is that focus on the materials element in the, recent, in the March document and um, how the, I suppose the impact of materials is increasing importance and over, there's a series of steps identified in the standard between an act by 2025, if I recall um, correctly, up to 2027 with a full, I suppose a life cycle assessment element to what goes into our buildings by 2030. Um, again, the climate action plan, we're hearing more about the low carbon construction methods and materials, talking about use, more use of timber, carbon sinks, and again, reducing that demand for cement. These are all converging and um, align with the work that we released 18 months ago. And then last week, or the week before, um, the IPPC's report, and again, we're delaying the risk of stranded assets. We need to do more, and we need to do it more quickly. So. How does the climate challenge sit in this? There's kind of five key strands to the climate challenge document available on the RII website. Um, so again, the operational energy, the embodied, we just touched on. Um, the water consumption, so setting out uh, you know, for a fit standards for efficient use in water. That would be about 10 litres per day per person for an office, a new build office building. We then have health and well-being in the metrics, um, as in metrics and standards set out in relation to that, looking at a lot of them taken from SIBSI, and, um, um, but health and well-being re regarding the radon in our buildings, um, VOCs, the CO2 levels, daylighting, and in particular, which might fall on from Shawnee's overheating um, and um, uh, um, standards also. And then biodiversity, to leave that site where we can better than we, we received it. So the, again, to enhance uh, the green and the green infrastructure that we leave behind us as architects and designers. My chat today will mo mostly look at this and a couple of case studies around um, um, buildings that have achieved these standards at, at presently or in the, in, over the past decade. So I'm going to keep moving because I know time is short, but again, just to note that the operation, the, the, we, when we talk about buildings, I suppose the focus for the last 20 years has been really that operational energy use. <laughs> So again, it's only one strand of the stages of our of the production of a building pro, or the building process. So if we look at this module CCB6 relates to the operational um, energy of our buildings. So there's a standard relating to that. Then we're looking at a standard in the climate challenge relating to the embodied carbon, and um, the, 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 that's the associated with the extraction, the manufacture, the uh, assembly, the transportation. Um, the replacement and the um, and the disassembly of our building uh, buildings and the materials in it, and then we put the lot together. We have a much better sense of the whole impact, so the whole life carbon impact of the buildings that we are delivering. And again, to keep in mind in relation to the operational water use, and it's just when you do start modelling, and David might be more familiar with the detail of this, but you know the impact of reduce of that reduction in the water consumption and how that directly impacts the. Um, the energy consumption of the building, notwithstanding the other benefits of reducing water consumption. Operational energy. So, what is the standard? The standard for um, the standard is set out. First of all, the 2025 standard. There's no point talking about in relation to non-domestic buildings. Um, by the time you, if you're starting a project today, by the time you deliver that building, <laughs> 2025 is likely to have lapsed or passed. So, I'm going to focus on 2030 because I think. Uh, that's where we need to go, or we're, we're at this point, particularly for commercial buildings or non-domestic. 55 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum, but that is the that's the regulated and the unregulated roads. That is the total consumption of the building, regardless of the source of that energy. So that's um, that's the target as set out. That's um, so it's different to deep or neap. We're not talking about um, we're not um, we're including the plug load, the laptop, the appliances. Um, in these in these figures so again how do we do that so the 55 kilowatt hour we look at things like the fabric first approach which I'm kind of probably here wearing that hat today 
then to minimise the energy demand and to use efficient services, which David might maybe touch on in his section, so the use of efficient services and low-carbon technologies. And then the third element is the maximising of the on-site renewables. So make it as low as possible before, you go, before we um, take that stepped approach. So the 55, how do we get there? So I'm going to show a couple of case studies for the different metrics and the different categories. So this is um, a near Road Erin building, um, Port Lease Train Drivers building. So again, um, this, is, this building was designed using the Passive House Planning Package. So it accounts for regulated and unregulated loads in the software. Um, 38 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So it's comfortably sitting within the 55 um, kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. Um, David Hughes was um, or a, um, a, a member of the um, Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland as the, the lead architect in this project. And he, he, at that time, there was significant effort made as well in relation to the embodied carbon of that, of the materials that were selected to reduce uh, um, a very high a fabric first approach, exceptional levels of air tightness um, and low air permeability. Um, and um, efficient um, heat recovery ventilation and, and a heating system through a compact unit. And finally, um, the when he got to that point and everything was solar, supplementing then with um, solar um, evacuated tubes to, for th thermal for the hot water demand for the building. That was 12 years ago. So that building was doing what we need to do 12 years ago. <laughs> um, more recently, we have the Erin Campus the South in Southwest College in Enniskillen. So again, this building is about 40, maybe 50 times bigger than um, the Air Road Erin building I showed you beforehand. But again, um, I, I, the, I would put this into the education category, which would have a lower threshold than the 55, which is more an office type building. So the, the education category in the climate challenge sets out a, a target of 40 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. This building is falling comfortably within that threshold monitoring underway of this building. I don't have data yet. Again, Barry McCarn of Southwest College, I'd like to acknowledge his support in, in providing information relating to this. It's a Passive House Premium pro, um, project. So it's one and a half, it's producing about one and a half times the energy requirement, well, the, the, the modeled or predicted energy requirement for this building. So again, we're seeing fabric first uh, approach. Um, if we look at, I had access to the model, so I could play with it a little bit. And it's, if you're, I'm not exactly an Excel geek, but I still get a bit of delight out of this. And um, I, um, if I start fiddling with even just one factor, like the air tightness in that building, there's very little probably carbon, embodied carbon impact to doing of, you know, better air tightness detailing, better care on site, creating a higher, it's, it's detailing and it's time, uh, but the material element of it isn't very significant. If I um, go closer to what might be normal backstops um, in terms of the air tightness level, look at the look at the, I almost triple if, it's, if this building becomes three air changes per hour instead of the exceptionally low point three that it is, I almost triple the heating requirement on that building. So that alone, that one measure alone, suddenly makes this building no longer comply with the forty kilowatt hours per meter squared by pushing it over the forty to forty two kilowatt hours. So these are low-hanging fruit. It's so, it's like <laughs> the winds are really easy on this. If as an industry, we can just, it makes the, the, um, the engineering team's job, the plant size smaller, the embodied carbon impact of all of that a lot um, um, less. So there's winds all around from a little bit better detailing and working really well with the contractors to make it as easy as possible to deliver more airtight buildings. Mind the gap. We're modeling. You're trying to make you use the most accurate tools you can to do this, and sometimes uh, the disclaimer might come in here now. But sometimes that may not be um, the partile assessment methodologies, and we're using other tools to maybe make inform these decisions and these designs. Um, so again. I, I suppose the importance, and it's come through in the document, the encouraging of members to collect the data in, of their buildings in use so we can continue align troubleshoot, but also continually, um, I suppose, realign and review the standards to see what the gap is. Is there a gap and how big is the gap between what we're predicting and what we're um, delivering or achieving in, when, when the buildings are in operation? So I suppose with that in mind, 
I, my own, our own kind of from our own more residential based monitoring of the buildings that we've designed, we are factoring in, uh, you know, a buffer to allow, you know, to kind of in the hope that we, well, we're generally a, a buffer to allow for, I suppose, the occupants behavior within the building to keep within the metrics that we're trying to achieve for 2030. Um, embodied carbon. So the embodied carbon, again, this is in relation to office building. We're saying 700 um, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per meter squared. So what might that look like? Um, this, uh, this case study was provided um, courtesy of Lidl, build, uh, BDP, and uh, Reba. This looks at Lidl make a good effort already, and they've thought about it you know, over for the last maybe decades in relation to the, the embodied carbon and environmental impact of their buildings. They use glue lamb, they use port home blocks. They have a system which has already considered this. Um, so they, um, kilo, they, sorry, kilogram CO2 equivalent for their buildings, 592, which is significantly lower than the 750 2030 standard. So they've done really well already by considering the overall structure and the framework of the building. And you can see here an understanding of where, like the MEP there coming in just shy of 15%. In this instance, the, 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 the vertical structure and facade are, you know, 30, 36, 37%. But you can see where the different, where the carbon that's embodied in the, the building materials um, lies in this particular structure. So they commissioned BDP to assess where the buildings are at present, and they're actually very good relative to um, the, um, business as usual. Um, but even through an exercise, they identified ways to bring that back in almost 30% through replacing um, PIR insulation with mineral wool, increasing the, the percentage of GGBS in cement in their concrete, um, reduce global warming potential of the refrigerants used, and even things like alternative ductwork products for M&E, which would be over my head. But I suppose there's wins on all different strands or elements to be had uh, a part of our, how we assemble our buildings and the components in it, and look at, to look at every level. I know it's quite challenging still in terms of the embodied carbon data that's available regarding relating to building services and components in buildings, but I suppose it, it feels like it's evolving and David may have more um, information on that. Another really valuable source, if you want to do better and try to do it now, is um, the LETI, formerly the London Energy, now it's think it's the Low Energy Transition Initiative, and they have a series of embodied carbon um, case studies available on their website, so you can see the measures we're undertaking, you can see what, what does a CLT building kind of look like in terms of the numbers for the embodied carbon in it, what percentage um, might be related to your MEP, but they're very useful as a, as a getting started, get to get your head around what's maybe good or less good. <laughs> so what about existing buildings? I suppose, personally, I don't want to, I don't, the buildings on, in our office at the moment, I don't want to be retrofitting them before I retire or trying to keep the retrofit requirement as small as possible. Um, I'm related, um, I'll finish up now shortly. So we, I'm okay. So we have um, uh, the, by 2050, um, all of our buildings will need to be up at the standard as set out by Georgina earlier. So what are we going to do about that and how can we do it? So I'm going, not going to repeat things that were already covered. Again, I suppose um, beyond regulatory, I suppose performance standards are, and you know, certain institutions in the states are already dealing with the, the risk of stranded assets. But, um, uh, and again, I, there's a lot of repeat here, so I'll leave this out. But the retrofit versus rebuild. So again, this role for the whole life carbon assessment and valuing the embodied carbon in the existing buildings that we have and what proportion of it um, will need to be removed, what, what proportion of embodied carbon added, and how do you assess that in comparison to a, a rebuild project? So to think very carefully about you know, the implications of ripping out a fit out, the, the, uh, valuing what's left in that structure, and then layering in a new fit out, for example. Um, how do you, it's, it's down to numbers and modeling, and it's not very glamorous, but um, I think they need to be data informed decisions. Um, I suppose I'm just questioning whether Part L assessments are probably not the best tool for making these very significant decisions in relation to the cost and environmental and carbon benefits of retrofit over rebuild. So do we either wait until we have, um, sorry, the AP, APB, or do we wait until we have the regulation trickle down or for that transition, or do we start to look at now, which is something that the Sustainability Task Force are on our agenda for this year, is to look at what a good retrofit for commercial type buildings might look like. 
So I've given an example here. This is an Entopia building in Cambridge by um, arc, the, the initial stages of this by archetype um, as a retrofit project with, I suppose, conservation complications also. Um, this building is the Cam University of Cambridge's sustainable or um, sustainable, in, uh, or sorry, <laughs> Institute for Sustainable Leadership building. Okay, um, what's important? This they've taken. This is a very deep retrofit project. The takeaways from it are uh, again a fabric first approach. They managed to achieve um, BRIAM outstanding certified um, Enerfit, as in certified passive house for um, existing buildings. Um, very good levels of air tightness. But look at the data, the energy demand of 57 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum for regulated and unregulated loads in that building. Um, the new build standard that we've set out in the 2030 is 55, so they're within a whisker of that. So I suppose this is a, I suppose a really interesting pathfinder project in terms of what can be done. And um, I think it, there's a, a, a series of links here, but I would, if you, there's a, an incredible amount of data available in relation to this project online. The CISL.com, their, their website actually even has the full breakdowns of costs by element. And it's, it's really, if, you want to, if you're into the cost benefit and the carbon benefit analysis, there's just a, an abundance of information available there, which I would encourage you to have a look at. So to conclude, action. 2030, the 2030 targets are achievable now. Buildings were built over a decade ago that could meet some of these metrics and have, and others have been built, but just not maybe modeled or calculated or assessed. Um, I suppose there's easy wins to be had, um, and particularly in relation to the fabric of our buildings, which re significantly reduced the embodied requirements or the, the service loads or the heating and cooling loads in our buildings. I'm personally trying to avoid planning to retrofit buildings that we're building now. I'd like to see out my career without substantial retrofit of our buildings. That's why we're trying to build to the standard now. Um, prioritize um, the retrofit of existing buildings and avoid demolition. So again, that whole life carbon assessment and the role of how important that is in terms of making those decisions um, uh, relating to rebuild versus retrofit. Architects and design teams can now sign up um, and commit to working towards meeting the RAI 2030 climate challenge on the RAI website and any architects or if you're in teams with architects, you might chat to them or encourage them to do so. Again, how do we make this better and how do we m m make things happen more quickly? So feedback and sharing and refining of this standard. So record and monitor building consumption in use and collect the data and we're sharing the data. Share your feedback and the lessons we're learning. Further research on alignment with other building performance standards, such as LEED. So this is on our hit list as the REI Sustainability Task Force. Um, client, uh, uh, a, it's imminent that the release of a client briefing document in relation to the climate challenge and the architect's, uh, I suppose, guidance and how to on the delivery of the climate challenge. We're expecting that in the next month or two. Um, and again, we're, it's a three-year review, so next year we're planning to review the metrics and the standard. So feedback, welcome to inform that, um, it, the 2030 standard on our review ne proposed next year. And our work for this year is to try and look at what, how can we supplement this to support and um, demonstrate what good retrofit might really look like. Thanks, Elena. That was extremely informative, and I think it's great to see that all the different sectors of the industry are taking their own initiative and coming up with ideas as well. And look, I think in terms of, I know that like the, the whole element of the embodied carbon there is obviously a huge, and it's a huge part of the EPBD, so it was really good that you raised it. And, and I think it also shows as well that anyone who's involved in the industry, no matter what you make, even if you are a small manufacturer and you make a very small element that goes into a building, those questions are going to start getting asked of the materials you use and how it's transported. So nobody's, um, I suppose, immune to, to the new EPBD. Um, so just in terms of the part there, and look, it, it was a good point you made in terms of the neap and deep, because I think no matter how often we say it, that these aren't design tools that um, obviously because people look at these, um, look at the results of them, and they judge buildings based on it, there is a 
there is a natural cause, uh, cause and effect there in terms of that. But I know that there's a there's a large review going on in um, SEI at the moment, and, and I'm sure there was people in the audience here who've been asked for their input about the current calculations and about how they can be improved. So that's something that I know is being looked at internally. Um, your point in regard to real data as well was obviously really well made, and I think the whole. The whole fabric first, I think, from a from a new build point of view, exactly, it's a, it's it's an absolute no-brainer. Um, I think in terms of the retrofit as well, ideally, it's the way to go as well. But I think for some buildings, if the if the fabric first is going to cause them stagnation from doing anything, just due to that, the cost of the fabric element, and I suppose there's the embodied carbon question as well, maybe sometimes. But yeah, look, um, I think fabric force generally from a new build and, and ideally as well from a retrofit. So look, that was really impressed to see everything that's going on, and hopefully we can have a bit more interaction going forward. Um, so next up is Shawnee Griffin from Erdan with the weather, or something similar. Sadly, I'm not a forecaster, so uh, I'm not Jerry Murphy, so you'll be disappointed there. Um, let's move on to the next one. Oh, no. Great. Thank you, Eamon. Uh, and apologies for the abrupt change in subject here. Uh, so I won't be talking with you about building design at all. Um, so the, the general um, topic that I'm covering here today is uh, the culmination of a project that's been running for the last two years uh, that was funded by the Department of Housing um, to update a lot of weather-related information that was uh, pertaining to building standards. Uh, so as part of um, both Climate Action Plan 2023 and 2021, and the National Adaptation Framework were uh, dealing with uh, this project. So um, there was a steering committee that was formed um, uh, comprising of uh, people from NSAI and SEAI and the Building Standards Committee for the Department of Housing. Uh, and then a lot of this other work that's listed here um, was done primarily by uh, two colleagues of mine, Carla Mateus and Barry Coonan. So I can't really speak too much on what they are, but there are a lot of uh, map outputs for uh, past extremes of things like driving rain, temperatures, and snow loadings. And there's been uh, previous reports published uh, in this kind of area, which can be found in these links uh, on the right-hand side. But the uh, main area that I'm talking about today uh, is the area for the past and future weather files for overheating analysis. Um, so the previously, um, the, there were uh, no freely available ones for Ireland, and so we have taken six locations around Ireland and have generated a test reference year and tree design summer years at six different locations uh, for past conditions, so kind of the previous 30 years. Uh, and then also took client projections from a project that will be concluding soon called Translate and use those to produce, again, the same collection of weather files for 18 different climate scenarios that can be used to, um, to consider uh, overheating risks as we move into the future. Uh, and so um, there was best efforts made to match the formatting and methodologies used to generate the SIBC files. Uh, so there should be a kind of smooth enough transition between the two. Uh, and the aim is that, actually I was hoping to have it for today, but there will be uh, data available online on MetAaron in the next 24 hours. Uh, there will be a news article in the news section of met.ie met where you'll be able to find the link to access the data, and it will all be freely available. There will be no um, pay to access it, and uh, the email address will be inquiries at met.ie, which is the climate inquiries unit, and uh, they should be able then to return data to you that you uh, require. Uh, so that's all. It was just a quick pitch uh, for the data, and uh, yeah, welcome any questions afterwards. Thank you.
Thanks, Shani. Uh, I think that's going to be of interest to a lot of people in the room, so appreciate you giving us a heads up on it. Uh, so next up is David Walsh from Intu. He's the Director of Sustainability in Intu, and he's going to give a presentation just on, on some of the research he's been doing on SEI's behalf. Okay, good afternoon everybody and thanks for your attendance today. Uh, my name is David Walsh, I'm Director with Into Engineering and today's presentation I'm going to, to give a quick introduction to Into, company um, that I represent and then following that I'm going to provide some insight into a project we've been un undertaking in conjunction with SEAI where we've been looking at potential options for carbon reduction in various types of commercial buildings. So um, just to introduce into, first of all, we're a building services engineering consultancy. Uh, we are involved in a lot of innovative and sustainable solutions for buildings. We've been um, in operation since 2002 with an overall staff of 83, and we have five offices in Dublin, Athlone, Belfast, London, and Berlin. Um, in particular, we undertake quite a high degree of building simulation, um, including daylight and sunlight analysis, um, CFD, computational fluid dynamics for wind and pedestrian comfort. And I suppose that those elements are more related to the environmental quality of the buildings. But then also we undertake quite a high degree of dynamic thermal modeling, and in particular energy, energy analysis, which really brings us on to today's presentation. So as I mentioned, the project we're involved with, we are looking at different commercial building topologies. And within that then, we're assessing various potential improvements um, in terms of energy and carbon. Um, and that they're both across fabric improvements, building services upgrades, and um, renewable technologies. So one of the building categories that we've assessed is a, is a hotel. So just to give you yourselves a bit more detailed insight into what we found in the project, we're going to uh, assess the, the hotel in a bit more detail. But just as an overview, these are the six building categories we've assessed. So we've looked at a hotel, a leisure building with a swimming pool, an office building, a retail, which is a, a supermarket, a warehouse building, and a bar, um, bar lounge area. So I suppose just to explain, each of these building categories we've looked at, they're really indicative buildings. We have based them in some ways on, uh, on real buildings, if you like, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not definitive buildings. They're just sort of building category types. So really what we've we found by uh, undertaking the energy assessment, and this is probably one of the most critical slides to digest from um, in terms of our in terms of what we found, and then I'll go into the methodology in a bit more detail. But this is almost given the summary of our findings. So this is representing the um, this is representing the, uh, the 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 various energy breakdowns um, within the building types. So um, the, if we take, say, the first pie chart there, and say at 12 o'clock, going clockwise, we've got heating is in red, hot water is in orange, uh, cooling is in blue, the green elements is fans and pumps, in particular f uh, fans, yellow is lighting, and purple is the equipment energy. So. We've undertaken this analysis using dynamic simulation modeling as opposed to um, as opposed to SBEM or NEEP or DEEP, if you like. And that's to allow us to include also the operational energy. But I suppose the main thing to say on this is that each building category has a very different breakdown in terms of its energy performance. And um, it varies then between, say, in a hotel building, because of all the showering that's required, 
the hot water consumption will be very high within that, that particular building. Whereas, say, when you go to a retail building, the vast majority of the energy within that will be lighting, which is the yellow, uh, can be often fans and pumps, which is the green, and the equipment actual operational energy of that building. So, you know, whilst we have been talking about the various uh, fabric first improvements and so on, as we'll see when we look at particular building for the hotel, in a lot of cases, uh, it wasn't necessarily the fabric improvements that was given the best energy reduction. And that was really the starting point is to have an understanding of the building category and what is the energy saving within that. Slight technical blip. Okay, apologies everybody for, for the delay there. So it, it does bring us back to, um, I suppose, a neat point in the presentation to move on to um, just outline how we assess the energy and carbon breakdown in one of the particular building categories, which was a hotel. So we took this hotel building, which is a three-star hotel in Dublin city centre, 180 bedrooms, and it has a total area of 9,500 meters squared, uh, includes a bar and lounge and commercial kitchen at ground floor level, uh, but no other leisure facilities. Um, and then what we done on each of the building categories was we developed an energy model, which as I mentioned, was undertaken using um, dynamic simulation modeling, as opposed to using Partel, BER, um, SBEM software. We then looked at various improvement measures and overall, we are then looking to achieve a, a pathway to, to net zero carbon or a ZEB building into the future. So we primarily focused on carbon as opposed to a BER rating, for example, for, I suppose, two, two main reasons, really, which is the, the simulations we're undertaking for the full energy within the building. So it's capturing all the operational energy in terms of equipment usage. Uh, as well as what is is calculated within a BER. And then secondly, um, in terms of looking at the 2030 requirements, we kind of adopted and adapted the public sector requirement for a 50% targeting in CO2 emissions by 2030. And that, that's what we, we look to, to achieve. So in terms of how we, how we uh, analyze each building then, so, um, 
the first thing in, in terms of fabric, and this has a and this has a bearing really on the results that we found is we assumed that the building fabric performance would be to 1991 building regulations. So the rationale behind that was twofold. First of all, to have a building of some age that would be suitable for renovation, if you like. And secondly, the 1991 regulations were the first, so it was the first time ever there was a definitive set of U values for walls and roofs and so on. So instead of trying to second guess what a, a building fabric might have been, we're saying let's assume it's built in 1991 building regulations. We then used um, national calculation methodology database information for the operation and usage within the building. So that's describing then on a room by room or zone by zone basis what a particular area of the hotel is used for, for the bedrooms, for the restaurant areas and so on. Um, and, and those are is used in BER and PARTEL calculations. So you just describe operational profiles in terms of occupancy densities and hours of usage and so on, um, and hot water consumption, et cetera. And within our dynamic simulation modeling, we're not just simulating the building performance, but also all the plant as well. So this schematic here is showing the various components um, that are assessed within the, the, the simulation modeling, which is, is TAS as the software that we used. So having set that up, we then simulate the predicted performance as a baseline. So again, you can see here, the colors are going red as heating, orange is hot water, blue is cooling, which has happened just a small bit in summertime. Green is uh, fan energy, yellow lighting, and purple equipment, and so on. But in order to give ourselves sort of confidence in any projected savings then for the, the, the building simulations we were undertaking, what we did is we matched the energy performance in both fossil fuel consumption, which is red, and electricity in green, against, in this case, benchmarks from Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, or SIBSI. Um, in their guide F, they provide quite a detailed breakdown of different building energy um, uses and uh, as, as benchmarks that we're able to use, not just on the overall, but also the individual categories like lighting and hot water and so on for, for each building type. Um, when we do this type of analysis on real buildings, we use the actual build data on a monthly basis and match the, the monthly profile for consumption in, in, in a more detailed manner. So having calculated the energy performance, that then gets translated into carbon. So in this case, the green is the fossil fuel, and the, uh, the dark green is the fossil fuel, and the light green is the elect electrical energy. So you can see how the electrical energy is generally consistent throughout the the year in terms of carbon emissions, slightly peaking in um, summertime due to some additional cooling, whereas the, um, the fossil fuel is more seasonal. But, but again, because of the, for the hotel typology, the high degree of hot water usage is meaning that, you know, there's this fossil fuel consumption right throughout the year. So as I mentioned then, in terms of our, our targets, we looked at each case then of a baseline, which is on the left-hand side, 2016 to 2018 is the baseline that we used in a similar manner to the, the public sector. There is then a natural reduction in overall carbon that has happened and is happening due to the grid decarbonization. So we're, the second bar chart there is projecting that, what the carbon emissions would be projected through to, to 2030 based on the grid decarbonization. I'll show on a later slide how, how we, we predicted that. And then the final bar chart there is the, um, the actual target showing the 50% the reduction. So the first elements we looked at were fabric improvements. And this is probably where we're getting to the, some controversial aspects because for the for roof and second one there is the wall. It's, incorrectly illustrated there is AHU, should be wall insulation. But we found negligible improvements. So what the graph is showing here is the left-hand side is our baseline, and then of our target 50% approximate reduction. 
And then the individual savings then are displayed as the top value is the current carbon saving on a like-for-like -like basis in terms of the electrical grid. The lower value then at 24% is, is allowing for the projection of grid decarbonization by 2030. That's, that's a natural reduction that's happening there in terms of the building performance, if you like. But we found that there was very little improvement to be gained for the roof and wall insulation. And really, this is to, due to a combination of factors. Down to the energy breakdown of the building, which as I mentioned for a hotel is, is primarily hot water as opposed to, to heating, etc. Secondly, I suppose the building type that we assumed was fairly cuboid in shape, so it has a low external surface to, to volume ratio. So the effect then of the, the, the U values in terms of the, the, the uh, external building elements isn't as, as amplified. And um, also that we are taking, or we, we did take as a baseline some extent of insulation. So the, as I mentioned, the 1991 building regulations, they have for a roof, uh, it's a U value of 0.25, and then we were looking at improvements, say, to 0.2 or 0.16. Whereas if it was a case that the, that the building, say that the roof is uninsulated, well, then major improvements would have been gained, like the 1% there would jump to, to 5 or 10% improvements, because it, it would be just, um, you know, you're improving from a U value instead of 0.25 for insulation to 1991, an uninsulated roof would be would be 2.5, so it's a tenfold increase in, in the, the carbon savings that's there. But overall, for upgrading roof walls, uh, glazing, etc., cetera, uh, the overall improvement for this building topology was, was only 3%. So again, the building type does influence that quite significantly. Um, I touched on retail earlier, which had similar, very negligible improvements for fabric. Whereas, you know, other building categories like in the in the public sector where we're looking at hospital buildings where it's, it's 24 seven operation in terms of heating, that's where you're starting to get, you know, 10, 20% improvement for, for increased insulation. So in contrast then we can look at the uh, improvement measures for, for building services. And I might just skip over to the, Second right, first of all, the lighting might be the easiest one to, to understand, first of all. So this is giving uh, an 8% reduction on current carbon levels. There's, uh, there's a slight increase in heating energy because the, with the lighting energy being reduced, the heat output of the lights um, decreases as well, so the heating has to go up slightly. <coughs> But overall, an 8% reduction that amplifies through then to 29% by 2030. The second one then to the left-hand side of that is the air handling unit. So this has both fossil fuel savings and electrical energy savings. The fossil fuel saving is due to introduction of heat recovery, that we're assuming that the, uh, the existing air handling unit wouldn't have any heat recovery. And then there's also a improvement for electrical energy associated with, with fan energy, essentially, due to variable speed fans uh, being considerably more, more efficient. And then moving left to that again is air source heat pumps. And this is really the technology that we're finding for all the building categories to give major improvements in terms of carbon performance. And of course, it's allowing a fossil, uh, fossil fuel free solution. So you can see on this graph here, the dark green fossil fuel carbon has, has dropped out. And then moving forward, there will be always the improvement um, in terms of carbon reduction as further grid decarbonization happens. So just to summarize that then, this is the combined fabric and services improvements in this case. So what that is showing is we're, we're kind of getting near to 50% on just on the, the current carbon emissions, if you like, but that's improving to 75%, 80% reduction of carbon by 2030. And that's generally where we've found buildings, the building categories to be 
we feel that that's achievable, that, you know, the 50%, we can go beyond that to more like 70, 75, 80%. And then that's just the breakdown of the energy. So the big improvements there are um, heating. The red has dropped, but that's mostly due to the, in this case, air handling unit and heat recovery being introduced as well as the heat pump, and of course the heat pump manifests itself as well in terms of the improvement for the uh, hot water. So just the final section then is looking at kind of pathway to net zero carbon. So the graph here is displaying the, the average CO2 intensity of the electrical grid that's been recorded from 2005 to 2020. So as you can see, there has been some years where it's increased slightly, but overall the general trend is downwards. And we've followed that trend through to 2030 to project that the, that the CO2 intensity will be around 0 0.16 kilograms per kilowatt hour carbon by 2030. And that's really what our, our calculations have been based on. So then if we look at that in terms of a pathway to, to net carbon, so the blue element of the graph is, is the baseline carbon emissions, if you like. That's dropping to the green is really the energy improvements, is the carbon reduction to the energy improvements that, that we have looked at. And then the trend downwards across the years towards, uh, towards 2030 is illustrating the projected improvement then in terms of carbon reduction for grid decarbonisation. And the, the value there at the 2030 is that 75% or so reduction as we've seen before. And then taking that further through to sort of 2050, you know, it's allowing us then to project that we're, we're achieving the ZEB performance, um, you know, sometime in the early 2040s in terms of, of, of those improvements. So just to conclude then, you know, the main takeaways so far of our of the project we've been involved in is like first and foremost the building application itself hugely influ influences where the optimum savings are for each different building category uh, generally speaking there's low savings for for upgrading insulation as opposed to adding insulation if a building is only insulated there will be major improvements to be gained but because it's a case of diminishing returns if there is some insulation there in the buildings for a lot of the categories we looked at, um, it's not as effective as we might have thought starting out. Just to mention the domestic hot water, and I suppose similarly some of the other energy categories are often overlooked, like when we, you know, we talk about energy improvements and carbon reduction, we automatically think of heating and, and insulation, but there's all the other components of energy within buildings that need to be, to, to be assessed. Uh, heat pumps in conjunction with the fabric upgrades is really where the largest improvements were found and I suppose not to, to, to leave the kind of general services upgrades, air handling units, pumps, um, lighting all, as well as heat pumps that all give quite significant savings and I suppose it is reflective, I talk about 1991 building regulations for example they had U values in it. There was nothing in there about how efficient a pump should be or how efficient lighting should be. So in a lot of cases, you know, the insulation was ahead of other aspects within buildings in terms of energy savings. And I think the last item there, the smart building tech neatly brings us on to a, probably our last speaker here. But overall, we found the ZEB target to be achievable, um, allowing for the grid decarbonisation with typical savings of around 70, 75% by 2030, you know, moving through to, to neutrality by into the 2040s. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, David. That was really informative. Um, and I think it's, it's great to see. I'm not sure how much other uh, detail is available out there currently, but, uh, but when all of this information is available, it'll be easily accessible for everyone. Um, obviously, as David shows there, like there's major 
differences between like the type, the orientation, the age of the building, even the shape of the building can make a major difference in terms of its uh, the impact of fabric, for example. So um, I suppose as well, just to say, obviously the, the Zeb we refer to here is looking at it in the context of that is like any electricity, we're available to take any electricity we want from the grid and we're assuming that the grid has been fully green by that stage, but obviously what ZEB will actually mean once the EPBD is released is another question. So um, just, to, just to clarify that in the way we reference that. So, um, so lastly, and again, as, as David says, moving on from uh, the last point that uh, David made there, obviously it was conventional installation of systems that we're talking about. Um, and what we really want to look at now is, I suppose, how we can make those systems even more efficient once they have been installed. So that's where Symphony comes in. So over to you. Thank you. If anybody was here last year, you might remember that we had uh, all the windows open and we froze to death and uh, we're trying to kind of talk about the uh, COVID ventilation levels and how we manage it with little CO2 monitoring devices. But uh, that's great if, you're, if you've got a hat and a scarf on, um, but nevertheless. Anyway, it's not so cold out today, you might, you might survive it. Last year, this window here was open, this door here was open, and the, the front panel just froze to death. Okay, well done for hang, hanging in there, guys. It's been quite the, quite the run. A lot of five speakers in a row, so uh, you're, you've battled it well. Uh, thank you to SEAI, particularly to Eamon, for, for the invitation to sp speak here today. Um, particular thanks to Eamon for passing this title, uh, you know, seriously. A deep retrofit effect without a deep retrofit budget. That's quite a tall order. Um, but I'm going to say something even more adventurous, and that is that from our experience, um, every air-conditioned building on average uh, in this country can have its energy reduced by 50%, 50% within a payback of three to four years. Uh, so that really is a deep retrofit effect without a deep retrofit budget. So uh, just, uh, well, Mike, if you, do, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't know you have a problem, you don't know to fix it. Uh, but of course, uh, we're, we're nice people. We don't talk about problems. We talk about challenges. Uh, so we need to uh, find the challenges, know what they are, and then we need to have solutions to get to answer those challenges. Uh, and that's the nature of what I'm presenting today. I'll have a look at a couple of case studies, and then uh, and I'll throw in some design advice, and of course there's Q&A at the end of this. Um, I'm not going to share too much about our company, just to, this, this kind of might put it in context for you. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers released their uh, climate tech Opportunity 2023 report in January of this year. So, so they would have scanned the whole industry. And in our sector, they chose us as the company uh, that is uh, a better than best practice company that's poised for scale. So that's how we sit in, 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 in the industry. Um, in terms of these challenges, we've, we've identified three key industrial uh, industry challenges. And quite frankly, if you don't tackle these, then you're really not going to get to the energy performance, the deep retrofit effect um, uh, that we're talking about. In fact, even if you have a brand new building and you haven't tackled these three, you're going to be challenged because we normally come on the retrofit side and we come to the newest, the lead platinum buildings, and we still implement these three, uh, tackle these three, three challenges. Um, the first challenge is the, we talked about the energy performance gap earlier on, mind the gap. Um, 
we're talking about an energy performance gap between uh, having got a good building design, uh, you've got a quality installation, uh, but there's still a performance gap between the aspired savings and the actual delivered savings. That's a huge challenge we ne that needs to be nailed. The second challenge is the year-round cooling demand. Uh, we've got, you know, thanks to thanks to uh, our EPD and uh, you know uh, our BORs, we've got insulated buildings, very well insulated buildings, airtight buildings. However, the internal heat gains from you know people lighting and equipment. Uh, builds up when you can't let it go out naturally. So that creates a, a year-round cooling demand, particularly in the newer buildings. That too needs to be tackled. Um, and then lastly, ventilation wellness. Uh, and I, I suggest any architects particularly listen to this one uh, because uh, we have done a great job in getting energy down on buildings by designing them to be minimum ventilation or naturally ventilated. And just the case in point here, natural ventilation is a challenge from a building wellness perspective. So you need to, for, for well, the emerging building wellness standard requires, you know, comfortable conditions, temperature, uh, humidity, and so on, but also clean air. Um, uh, we don't know what the condition of the air is coming from the street there. Uh, if it's not going through a filter in an air handling unit, if you don't have air conditioning essentially, then how can we uh, be, assure people of the building wellness standard? So. Uh, to get this wellness, it means, you know, typically, you know, more air and therefore more energy. So that's a challenge, it's working against us, so how can we work with it? So to address these three key uh, industry challenges, we've uh, identified what we call three pillars. Um, now, there's, everyone's invited to try and take on these challenges in whatever way they want. Uh, I'm going to give it to you from our experience and what, how we've approached it. Uh, so to tackle the... Uh, the, uh, the energy performance gap, the sort of that the design aspiration versus the built reality, uh, we enter the realm of what we call high performance algorithms. Um, a lot of buildings have got tremendous tech, tremendous equipment, and smart technology, but if it doesn't have the smarts behind the smart technology, then the smart technology is just a lot of expenditure uh, and very li limited gain. The second uh, uh, pillar uh, is to tackle the year-round cooling demand. Uh, we've devised a heat recycling process. If you can find something else, well and good, but what we've found is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and then the third one, in terms of wellness, uh, we've found that if you tackle the micro environment, if you tackle the air to the last point of where it's needed and get that right to drive, to deliver the indoor air quality, um, and then you work with the diversification of air across the building, then you can get incredible savings, but also deliver the wellness that's required. So focusing on pillar one, the high performance algorithms, uh, we look to map what we call the environmental signature of a building. Like every moment of every day, that environmental signature is shifting based on external conditions, based on plant operation, based on who's where, what's plugged in. So that's a very dynamic thing. But we try to, to, to map that. It requires a deep dive into the HVAC design of the building, the installation of the building. We look into the building physics and then the operational demands. So that's quite a, a, a heavy sort of intellectual uh, engineering exercise. Once we've got that environmental signature map, we then look to match that with an operational uh, signature. Um, and normally you think as engineers, heating, cooling, ventilation, how can we get them to sort of even work together? That's important, but I would say you go a step further and you get the individual components of those systems to work together interoperably. And as we like to kind of describe it, we get the components working in symphony with each other. It might be a little clue as to why we're called symphony energy. Um, so once we have our environmental map, uh, we've got our, 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 our matching operational uh, signature, we then need to operate, uh, automate both together. So the algorithms kick in and work with that uh, engineering piece uh, and deliver incredible sort of matching and, and energy savings accordingly. Uh, now, in, if you've got a fancy car or whatever, underneath the bonnet, 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 you just want to go from A to B, but if you're running the car or mechanic, you need to lift the bonnet from time to time. So, Likewise, in the building here, you want to have some visualization of what's going on you know, with the sophistication of the, of the high performance algorithms. So we suggest that it be brought up onto a cloud platform so you can actually in, uh, uh, visualize what's going on and have some influence over it. So um, we refer to a, a cloud platform as a single point of truth. Why? 
because you bring all your rich data together. It's not just one system here on that computer or one on another login or whatever else. It's integrated to get together. You bring all your BMS data in, you bring your IoT data in, and then we work um, mathematics on the hard data to generate virtual data, which becomes the real insightful data that drives your building performance going forward, both from an energy perspective and practically anything else. We get, obviously, predictive alerts coming out of it. We can uh, sort of foretell what's coming on the tracks. We can ramp um, um, uh, loads up and down in accordance with anticipated demand and so on. So the, 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 the virtual data that comes from the hard data becomes absolutely key and, and, and very powerful. We visualize then also your KPIs. You need to keep a track of your KPIs, so you have a dashboard for that. Um, we uh, get essentially a digital twin of your BMS on the cloud, and then you have an analytical tool that you can work across that, spanning all the data types. It's not just a matter of going into your energy monitoring sort of platform and then trying to do an analysis on energy monitoring alone. You're actually data analyzing all the data platforms together. Um, and then, uh, from an ESG perspective, I make reporting is really important. Uh, uh, people, you know, the drive for ESG reporting A and B, good ESG numbers, when you're reporting the numbers are good, is, is key. This is already ready, so it would program it to have these automated ESG reports, or at least reporting data that can go into some of these ESG reports. So this whole platform has the end in mind where we know in the end that the building asset owner has to report data, and he has to report good data, and this kind of automates that process. Um, the second pillar, uh, which is to deal with the year-round cooling, this is where we've um, uh, kind of developed a solution, which what we call, our particular solution is called Symphony Cycle, but it's a heat recycling process. Um, it's a quick win, um, and it, we've patented it, and it's got a license model. Anyone can implement it in their building with a license. But just essentially how it works, this is like a traditional basic sort of explanation of a HVAC system. Um, when you think of it not being summertime, think of winter, spring, and autumn. Um, you've got your air system, which is uh, providing air to your room. Um, you typically have a room that's overheating like here, and you need to get rid of the heat, and then you've got some other corner of the exhibition over there that needs heat because it's kind of close to outside. So uh, you'll have your chiller on uh, to deal with the overheated room, and you'll have your boiler on to give the top up heat to the underheated room. You'll also have your boiler giving trimming up heat on your air supply. So if you have heat recovery, you probably need to trim it up a little bit further. So notionally, your chiller's on, and say your boiler's at 70%. Introduce the heat recycling process, and what we do is uh, in completely counterintuitive. Your cooling coils in your hand air handling units are redundant out outside of summertime. You don't need to cool your air if it's not summertime. However, we recognize that outside of summertime, your chill water temperature can be allowed to drift up a little bit because it doesn't have such a high load to deal with. And what we do is we repurpose that cooling coil to actually take, uh, uh, rather than the, the heated cooling water going back to the chiller, we divert it into the cooling coil. That offloads its heat into the airstream, so you're getting this free heating going into the airstream, and consequently, by offloading its heat, it gets colder, and that cold water goes back to the overheated room, and you get this free cooling effect, 100% free cooling effect. Conversely, with that transfer of heat, you're putting it where you want it, it's 100% free heating, which goes into your heating system. And that effect, your chiller's off entirely, and the primary, primary pumping, and if there's, if there's conden condensing pumping as well, that's off, and your boiler's step back or off. So it's a phenomenal process. It's got zero input energy because your fan's already operating, your pumps are already operating, so it's almost like perpetual motion in effect. Uh, uh, with, I leave it up to yourself as whether it's a 100% efficient process or a 200% efficient process because it's doing two things 100%. Um, so we've, we've found from, we've just rolled this out last year on pilot projects, we're finding that this, this process alone is delivering up to 30% on, uh, uh, on the total heating demand for a building and 30% on the total HVAC electricity demand in the building. Um, and then uh, going back to this point I mentioned earlier on in relation to building wellness, if you don't have air conditioning, conditioning of a sort, how are we going to actually deliver buildings that are actually well, building well and meeting the building, building wellness standard? And then if we do that, then we're going to have to pay the air, con air conditioning costs. But with this, you've essentially got almost free air conditioning for most of the year. 
And um, we've our two pilot projects so far, this process has run for, on, on one building's run for 82% of the cooling time schedule. So 82% for free and 18% with chiller on and so on. And in the other building, it's 87%. So it's a phenomenally effective almost year round. It even tips in and out in summertime. So it's not just a exclusively a wintertime uh, solution. Um, so anyway, we just, we, we, a license can be gotten 10 minutes online it's, and it can be implemented within about 48 hours on site. It's a very, very quick turnaround uh, solution. Uh, our third pillar uh, to, to deal with ventilation wellness is, um, is, is, is to, is to, is to ad uh, address the micro environment. So we're looking at uh, essentially diagnosing the indoor air quality in a particular space. So looking at temperature, humidity, CO2, maybe TVOC, maybe particulate matter and so on, light, noise and, and all that. So, so you're, you, you measured that, that's your diagnosis. But for a microclimate, you also need to cure it and you need to cure it locally. You can't just leave your central plant running to, to give a design capacity to the building so that every meeting room and every open plant space has got its design load because people move around and they're the people who need the air. So we need to get the air to follow the people. Uh, and that's what we do where we sort of get this, this sort of local diagnosis and local cure. Um, we have a product that does that very sort of like cost effectively called Simply Well Tech. But anyway, there's other ways to skin that cat, as I say. Um, but ultimately, you have less air to push, less air to heat, and that means less energy consumed. And better than design IAQ. How's that? Because if you can reduce the air supply you know, from your central plant to a space that doesn't need it, based on dynamic sort of measurement, and then you've got more capacity to drive it to the areas that do, areas that do need it. So if you take a meeting room that's designed for 14 people, you know, before, we, before you applied this, 14 people go in and they should have enough air, but if 18 people go in, they won't have enough air. But with this process here, because you've worked at the diversification of your capacity, you can drive more air into that space and actually get better than design IAQ for that space and for any space in the building for that matter. So it's, it's a triple win. <laughs> Less air to heat push and better than design IAQ. So ultimately, uh, these three, uh, um, when you tackle these three sort of challenges square on in whatever way you do it, if you really do tackle them, and we believe we'll, we managed to do that, we're looking at savings of between 50 and 80 percent. And uh, it doesn't have to be an old building to be 80 percent. We're actually finding that it's the newer buildings. Uh, we tend to be brought to the newer buildings because they figure that they've got other things to do in older buildings, but um, these are the kind of savings you get even on the newer buildings. Um, and it can be done in less, I'd say a three to four year payback at today's prices and five year of payback at, at, at uh, 2021 prices. Um, if you've reduced your actual energy demand by 50 to 80 percent, well, what does that do to your plant? Well, if your car is only you know, doing 6,000 kilometers per year rather than 18,000 kilometers per year, any idea why the resale value of that car is going to be more than the one that did 18,000? Well, it's the same thing here. If you're running your plant for a lot less, then the maintenance is a lot less, and the lifetime of the plant is a lot longer. So we don't even factor that in, but that's a reality, and it affects the embedded energy because you're not bringing labor and materials on maintenance so much, and you're not having to replace it as, as regularly. So here's a, here's a case study. Uh, now, before I, before I kind of uh, get into this, and this will be brief, but I just want you to put, kind of picture this in your mind, and, and it was mentioned by some of my colleagues here earlier on, the importance of getting your energy reduction first down, get it down, and then you kind of gear your plant and your design accordingly. This is a Lee Platinum building, um, a fabulous building, um, but the energy we've reduced in this building using the three-pillar approach, attacking those three challenges, if you were to um, offset that energy saved with PV panels on this building, you would need 10 times the roof area to get the equivalent of the energy we've saved using the three-pillar approach. So if we had, didn't come with the three pillars and we want to reduce by that amount of energy, we need 10 times the available roof space. It's just not going to happen. So we really need to uh, get that sort of tackled first, uh, the, 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 the three pillars tackled first before we get onto the so solar. And then when the solar comes along, 
it'll be a higher proportion of what's remaining to be tackled. So that's just an, an imagery. Anyway, it's a, it's a Hibernia uh, Reese building, one Cumberland place, very well designed, uh, tightly operated, uh, lead pattern in 2018, and we deployed all three pillars uh, in February of last year. The three pillars, the high performance algorithms, the heat recycling, and then the micro environment we used our, our, our kit and all of that. And the results were 70 percent. This is a lead platinum 2018 billing. We're talking about 70 percent reduction in the total heating on this building, and uh, the equivalent 70 percent on the HVAC electricity for this building. Um, that's extraordinary, and we're able to d d deliver a, a, you know in better indoor air quality environment uh, while actually making the energy performance that much better. And then all these other fringe, you know, sort of side benefits which are really, really significant. They've got a, a cloud platform to, for data integration, for analysis, for applying their ISO 50001 going forward. It's a tool that really helps them to sort of be geared to con for continuous improvement going forward. Um, they've got their measurable ESG, essentially future now. Um, and if anything, we expect those savings to increase over time. The second case study, again, um, I, I, it's a great building, an award-winning winning, winning building, the RIAI Irish Architecture Award 2018, voted Ireland's favorite building. Um, again, well-designed, tightly operated. I mean, I'm talking about really, really good operators. I mean, of course, I have, have awards for their estates team and how well they operate the facilities. Um, but uh, we're actually handling a portfolio of eight billions, but this, this was the newest one. And this is the one which was like, well, sure, it's brand new, it's very efficient. Uh, try and do something if you, if you wish. And so we said, sure, so we'll try three, three pillars in this. So we, off we went, three pillars, high performance algorithms again, um, uh, heat recycling and then the microenvironment. And when we added that all up together, well, lo and behold, 70% gas savings across the building and even higher, 80% HVAC electricity savings. It's incredible, it's absolutely incredible um, what can be done when you take this approach first. Um, and we're really kind of sitting on the back of the good work of engineers and architects who've actually done a good job in the first place, but there's this piece that's missing in, in between that is the construction industry is perhaps blinder to. There's actually a big chunk of work. It's not just, I know it looks like a low hanging fruit, but there's a lot of work to actually get the smarts in behind the design and equipment that you have, but it's an essential part that can be brought in at design stage, it can be brought in before the building's built or before it's even, let's say, occupied at least, um, or it comes in later on as a retrofit. Obviously, you can get a little bit more saving if you can get involved earlier in the project. We're open to that, but um, certainly as a retrofit, and um, the kind of targets we're trying to achieve and the finances available there to get there, this is, uh, I think, a no-brainer. Um, so, just to throw in a little bit of design advice, I think I've got a little bit of time here still. Is that okay, Eamon? Yeah, Grant. Um, so, um, entropy. Okay, engineers, entropy. Just don't fight it, guys, okay? So, entropy is where it's really expensive in energy perspective to try to operate a heating system on high temperature. Really expensive from a cooling perspective to try to run a cooling system on low temperature. You're fighting against em entropy. Design for low temperature heating, design for slightly warmer temperature chill water period. Uh, the second point there, um, if you want to get the heat recycling thing, you can't do it with VRF. So chill water is the way to go if you want to get that. If you want to get the free air conditioning essentially for perhaps up to 80 plus percent of the year, then consider chill water rather than VRF. Uh, third point, yeah, we'd consider heat recycling from the outset. Fourth point, um, if you've got hot water demand in the building and you've got heating, uh, particularly if it's a boiler arrangement, separate both of them, generate your hot water separately from your heating. Invariably, no matter how theoretically independent they are, it's hard to, it, we find that it just, it just gets merged together and it's not a particularly good outcome when it's on the same system. Point number five, again with the heat recycling, it's best to have your chill water coil before your heating coil. Um, number six, um, we see this time and time again, even in, in great buildings where you've got different uh, zone or, or load types and they've got one heating circuit going to them, and then in the end, you end up over-serving an area that doesn't need it. Get them onto ind independent circuits. Uh, point number seven, uh, filtered rather than natural ventilation. I'm open to solutions on that, that, it, that where natural ventilation can work, but if we're gonna go for building wellness, you need to get particular matter under control and other things, and you need to know that you can get the air turnover where you need it. 
with central systems, you can get heat recovery and so on. Um, but if we can get them to work at almost free, then we've got the best of both. Uh, number eight, uh, architects again, perhaps, um, and certainly uh, estate agents when they're letting out buildings. If you have a tenant who's got a high concentration heat load in a spot or, 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 or lots of space that's relatively vacant, then your heating system is going to be always trying to be on to deal with the space that needs the heat, and your cooling system is going to be fighting to take care of the hot spots. Try to blend out your loads as much as possible or segregate the high, the high demand loads so that your central plant can work in a very sort of, let's say, um, efficient manner across the year where it's kind of matching a fairly balanced load across the building. So just watch that one. Number nine, um, again, the wellness thing, get the microenvironment in place. Number 10, uh, uh, air supply to rooms. Uh, if you've got a variable control damper, damper that's used for measuring the amount of air that goes in, they're normally a manual device. Some of these can spin 360 degrees and you can never know exactly what position it's in, particularly if you go to automate it later on. I did just go for the sort of zero to 90 open, close uh, uh, variable control dampers because then, then they can be, they can be uh, uh, repurposed for variable, variable control later on. So that kind of ties it up and the summary statement in all of this is that uh, the greenest energy is the energy we don't use. Um, and I think it's self-explanatory. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. That's really interesting. And I think um, Tom's an example of a lot of the innovation that's happening out there, certainly in the, in the area of uh, smart building technology and different innovations. So um, thanks very much for showing us that, Tom. And I think it's an example as well. It kind of brings us through on the arc, I suppose, all the way from the regulations that's coming along, but from an architectural, an m and &E, and then also a, a, a controls or a smart building technology point of view. All the tools are out there and there's, there's people there to do it. So I suppose if we can start moving things along before that regulation kicks in, that would be, I think, ideal for everyone. And I suppose just in terms of your title of your speech, that was, that was your promise, not mine. So, <laughs> so, um, so look, um, we're going to open it for questions now, I suppose. I'm just going to, just a very brief comment just in terms of, I suppose, what, what SEAI has available on the commercial side of things. The, um, there's two existing grants, SSRH and Exceed, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, which being, have only just been relaunched there last month and are much more attractive, much more easy to apply for, and is much more available in terms of grant funding and things that are available in terms of getting grant funding for. So if you want to look at those, and then as well as that, I suppose, as part of my role, later on this year, uh, we'll be launching um, a different style, more for an SME size of businesses, uh, a large range of different elements, which will include optimization and access to technical data, or technical assistance if you're doing designs and you want help on that, as well as commoditized grants as well for different uh, types of services. So watch this space for that. But uh, I'm gonna open the floor for questions now. If there's anyone, if you wanna put your hand up, I think Owen will give you a, a mic there and you can do your thing, thanks. integral to how we proceed to zero energy buildings. The issue at the moment is I deal with a lot of design teams on, exist, on new buildings. A lot of times the architects do not know how to calculate a U value. They do not know thermal bridging. They do not know the requirements that's currently required of them in the building regulations under today's date that's been in there for majority of my life and then they're saying they've never done it before and now that we're going to have to upgrade buildings external insulation internal insulation look at the thermal bridging around them as well how is that education going to be put out there when it's not already there to begin with <laughs> I suppose, just in terms of the, from the educational point of view, um, I think there is, there's obviously a responsibility on the different, on different disciplines, no more than the M&E engineers, 
there's a responsibility of all the different sectors to be up to speed with the with the regulations and to get that education. And obviously, the different societies such as ACAI and the RAAI um, are, are very good at, at promoting that. But there is a certain responsibility on on people in particular industries as well. And obviously, SEAI will be doing a large amount in that regard. But that doesn't remove the responsibility of the people who are who are charged with that as part of their discipline to um, to be aware of those requirements. I suppose it would be my opinion on it, but if you want to. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the Sustainability Task Force know there is a, there's a gap. Not everyone has the same level of interest or experience. We have a review, of, well, it's just approved in terms of the environmental accreditation system for architects, which would be graded and a CPD to support that. Uh, but it goes more. It goes back further. It's much more fundamental to architectural education. So there's quite an, an EU-wide review at the moment in terms of architecture and and review of kind of I suppose how architecture is taught in terms of our understanding of the environmental elements you've just examples you've just mentioned and the broader I suppose climate challenge and how architects can respond much better to that. In uh, in addition, to, in parallel to that, there's a review of the competences to become a registered architect. And again, a much heavier weighting in terms of the environment and the sustainability requirements around that. So it's, it's a series of facets. It has to go all the way back to um, first year in training for the professions, I think, in the built environment generally, in terms of their understanding of the challenges. But I suppose that embracing of the technical by you know, my colleagues at the Sustainability Task Force, we are probably a little bit more interested in the technical and the average, and we are aware there's a system. So give it about six months, you, we should see some of that CPD and that training coming through. But we're very well aware that there is a gap to be bridged there. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with everything said there. And um, I'm the chair of the Women in Engineering Group with Engineers Ireland. Um, and they do have a CPD committee and a sustainability committee. So I would encourage any Engineers Ireland members to speak to Engineers Ireland and talk to them about your CPD wants and needs. Um, and they do run design, of specific design and specification of NZ buildings as a CPD course. And they also run um, design and specification of heat pumps. Um, you know, they're CPD courses, but I've done both of them and they're, they're a mixture of online and in person. Um, and they're quite good as a start. So, like, it, you know, it has to be, as Eamon says, a two-way process between the industry and these bodies who provide training. So do engage with them, even if you're not a member. You know, you can do their training and pay a bit extra as a non-member. Um, you know, so they, the, the CPD committee will like to hear from people in terms of them having relevant training available. Thanks. Uh, hi, Archie O'Donnell is my name. Um, I don't think I'd be alone in just complimenting the uh, the panel on absolutely fantastic um, presentations. Just the depth and the scope there was was brilliant, and you brought a lot of clarity to an area that's uh, you know it's difficult to interpret. It's 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 quite vague uh, in, in in some areas. Um, just a question for uh, oh sorry, just before I get to a question. Um, Joseph Little and Technical University of Dublin have a lot of training courses for engineers and architects, and they're really quite good in, in getting into the technical side of net zero and, and uh, passive house. Um, my question, though, for Georgina, just relates to, um, I suppose, the new the EPBD recast and the new Part L. And really for, for designers and, and energy consultants that are looking at decarbonization and looking at new buildings uh, in, in particular, uh, looking at master plans, we're finding it difficult to um, interpret how renewables will be dealt with. So if you have a, a, a whole district or you have a, a building and you want to get that as net zero, offsetting isn't really going to be the biggest part of that solution. We're going to have to look at um, uh, renewables. Now, you're limited enough in what you can get with on-site renewables, and you have to look at uh, district renewables. So it'd be good to get some clarity on the definition of nearby renewables. And is that, compl is that solely about uh, heat? Is that district heating is the only nearby? Or can you use, say, a PV farm that's 20 miles away? So it just needs to be some more clarity around um, how you are going to displace your embodied energy 
or your embodied carbon, sorry, by using renewables. Uh, it's just that intent of the EPBD, it's going to completely fundamentally change how you deal with energy, and it has to be on a district level, and that's going to be a challenge, and it'd be good to get some guidance, and there really needs to be more urgency. We can't wait for the EPBD to be clarified, we can't wait for building regs 2025 or 2027, or um, decarbonisation, kind of whole life cycle carbon rules to come in, in in 2030. That's all too far away. I think we need prescribed routes, and I think, well done to Helena and her team. I think they're kind of setting good practice targets, and Letty setting good practice targets. We just have to lock them in and uh, move forward as an industry with clarity on what is net zero. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I mean, we do we do need to um, ramp up district heating and nearby sources of energy. Um, you know, renewable energy. Um, so other countries in Europe are far ahead of us in terms of district heating, and we are you know we are moving that way. And Kodima are doing are doing a lot of work in that, and SAA working with them. So yeah, we'll have to. Look, I agree with you that we have to move forward, you know, quicker. And this, the Parliament has published their proposals back in March, and we're waiting for agreement on that. So it's still being negotiated between Parliament and Council and all of the um, the European partners. Um, so we're hoping that we'll have a publication very soon. But yes, district heating. I mean, we were at a site visit in Amsterdam in September, and they brought us to um, you know, social housing, and they're doing 100 units at a time. So they'll take 100 units, and this sounds, you know, how could we do this in Ireland? But they take 100 units and move those people and take all of those people off the gas grid and put them onto a district heating scheme. And while they do that, they're renovating, so in, ex internal insulation and doing fabric um, on those 100 units. Um, and then when the 100 units are done, they put the people back in the houses and do the next 100 units. Um, it's all district heating. Um, so we need to look as a country at how we can scale, you know, how we can look to that and how, how we can scale that up. Um, you know, and as John, Tom said, I mean, the best energy, we, we need to look at fabric first and energy efficiency. Um, but for sure, renewables on site are a challenge for commercial buildings because you have a tall building compared to the footprint, so how can you get enough energy from solar on the roof? You possibly can't, because your, your roof print is smaller compared to the height of your building, um, whereas in a home, it's more doable. Um, so, yeah, look, I agree with you, district heating has to be ramped up. And heating and cooling, you know, district cooling possibly is, is used in Europe a lot, but we need to, to look to that in Ireland as well. There's, there's districts uh, heating infrastructure in the Docklands and I mean there's been Tala. millions millions of square foot developed in the Docklands and not connected. So you know there just isn't the urgency there to, to see those. They're 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 good in, in principle, they're not implemented. And really district heating should be a mix. It should be putting low temperature district heating in the street and then heat pumps in the house. I don't think we can use you know in Holland they have a different legal system. Yeah, no, and just to your just to your point, and I think all your points are well made. And uh, like in terms of the urgency, we do accept that. Obviously, there's really good stuff being done there by the RAI. But I suppose at the same time, we are to some that we are latched on to the whole EU side of things as well. So there is a danger if we if we jump the shark. I suppose in terms of deciding, <laughs> advising people say. Given that it's coming, in, it's coming in June, and we'll have some clarity. And even before it gets brought into Partel, we'll have the ability after that to start. We'll have the documentation then. So while it won't be necessarily a regulation at that point, we'll be safe to start telling people what's you know gradually the ways we're planning on implementing what the fixed document is. But there is a risk before that, even in terms of how we calculate embodied carbon. If we pick something that's currently there in the industry. And then the way it's decided within the EU, EU to calculate it, we've sent people down the wrong road. So hopefully, we're in nearly in April now, so hopefully by June, we, we, we'll have a much more solid way. So I take your point in terms of the regulation, but I think 
once the June date hits, if it's if it is June, we can start. We we'll, we'll have a solid basis to start the advice phase of that. Um, but I do take your point on. In terms of down the docks, the majority of buildings in uh, any building in the last number of years that has been constructed within that area has had to include the, the, the ability to connect into that district heating system when it does eventually come on board. So I suppose they're not a totally lost case at, uh, as well in that regard. So thanks for your question. That was really good. Anyone else? Everyone's hungry. Probably so um, in relation to the operational energy, should that not be kind of split into two different versions of operational energy? Just say if you have, you measure all the regulated and unregulated loads within the building, but you have a heat pump, and if the heating consumed to say a million kilowatts, but if that heat pump is 300% efficient or 400% efficient, that building actually consumed 400 million kilowatts of heat, but only one million of it is accounted for in the, um, say within the regulated loads. So overall, the heating demand stays the same, but the amount you actually consume in theory reduces because of the heat pump. Or similarly, if you have PV panels, you're not actually reducing your energy consumption by um, 500,000, 100,000 kilowatt hours. You're just reducing the amount that you have to pay for. So should that be nearly split up into operational energy, excluding the benefits of any renewable energy, and then operational energy, including the benefits of renewable energy? Are you sorry? Are you speaking in regard to when you're doing your carbon calculations for the building? You're well, yeah, you're the carboners carb say like you know the RA, the RIAI, where they say like the operational energy should yeah. be 25, 50, whatever figure. Those figures should be. Should yeah. that not have one including the benefit of any renewables and the other of what's actually consumed, including the free energy from the air for heat pumps? I suppose the, the, the focus is on the actual consumption regardless of the source because I suppose if it's kept, if we get to those kind of levels, it makes the renewables we've just we've been talking about much more feasible for many more buildings. So that's why we're not, we're kind of the clarity is what the building consumes and then how you feed that, you layer in as the next layer, but get it down as low as possible. So that's why it's been, the target's been set up the way it's been set up and we're not kind of taking in the value of you know, it's another overlay. You, you will do better then if you get it down to that level. I suppose the contribution your renewables can make a, a significant impact on that number when you get there. So the, your panels, etc. So that's the rationale behind that. So in theory, if I have a building that has a gas boiler, and I replace that with a heat pump, all of a sudden, no other changes, just gas boiler to heat pump. That heat pump now brings the operational energy lower, despite the original energy demand within that building broadly remaining the same? Um, the thing that to get to the numbers, I think to get to the numbers we're talking about, that one measure won't get you there. Or like, say, kind of, for example. Yeah. So I think um, um, the, the, you know, you actually have to, to get any of those numbers to work, you have to be at um, almost passive fabric. So, you know, it, the, what, what to it becomes much less, um, What's generating it, it becomes less of an issue if the, when the heat loads are so low, if you know what I mean. So then you're down to, you're unregulated, which depends on the building type, what percentage that might be on top of it. So that's, um, is that helping in any way? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's still kind of... Just to say, like, the, certainly the correct approach is to reduce the heating demand, to our energy demand generally, as far as possible. And then as a second step, it's reducing the consumption, which is taken on board the efficiency. So obviously yeah. heat pumps play a major role there. And then as a final, um, you know, as a final uh, improvement then by renewables, be it PV or solar, thermal. But, you know, all that comes into the mix then as a bottom line of either carbon emissions or primary energy, whichever is, is looked at. And, you know, that, Carbon emissions essentially factors in all those different variables to give a, a bottom line, really, that's, that's useful to, to benchmark and, and compare. And just to, I suppose, to kind of speak to your point there, like the, the idea of, you know, taking out a boiler and putting in a heat pump, obviously that is potentially something that could happen, and I suppose it feeds into what Georgina mentioned there in regard to the, the new EPBD, that renovation passport element that's there, and you'd hope that 
it's nearly something that, uh, although it's not going to be compulsory, that when the that's similar to the BER, that it's things that people, it's it's something that, and like the industry could decide. So, for example, it, it could be something that becomes sa standard with solicitors that they they're advising their clients that you should be getting a renovation passport, like along with the ESG and all this other stuff, and the risk of stranded assets the renovation passport, you would hope, along with the good advice from REAI and ourselves and everyone else, that somebody's not going to get stuck in that position where, because in reality, if they did change the boiler out for a heat pump, where all those other elements should have happened, it's they're the ones that that's going to lose out, really, when the electricity bill comes. So, And just, uh, just the, the regulations, uh, you know, for new build now is really to get the fabric right. So, you know, not, not too worrying about how much kilowatt hours will be still going out through your fabric, you know, it, it, the regulations there to sort of tackle that. Your second step then is kind of, you know, go back to the mantra of the greenest energy is the energy you don't use. You then want to sort of use your, your high efficiency equipment and the smarts behind that to get that right down so that what you're left with is a, a roof area that's capable of picking up the remainder load or at least a, por a good portion of it. And even at that, the renewable energy equipment has got embedded energy, it's got maintenance, whatever else. So back to Greenest energy is the energy you don't consume and drive that down first. I think we're all on the same page on that. Yeah. Thanks. Anthony Farrell. Uh, thanks very much. Excellent presentations. Uh, just two questions. One is on the benchmark uh, with SIBSI. Um, you say that you're more accurate to compare on a monthly basis. Is that taking the average uh, benchmark value for, from TM41? to funding Y12 and then looking at the monthly for each uh, each month and comparing it to see if it breaks that threshold? Uh, no, it's two separate things. For these buildings we've looked at within this project, they're indicative buildings. So for those, we use the SIBSI benchmarks on an annualized basis. Where we're assessing real buildings, we use the monthly build data, or down to hourly if it's available, for example, for electrical Right, so you're looking at the monthly for the nominal building, but you're comparing that to what the equivalent monthly is from the seat, from the benchmark to see what the threshold level is, because it's only published as annual as far as I know. Yeah, well, we match the simulation data to the measured building performance, where we have that for a real building. We're often comparing it to, to the benchmark, but that's just secondary information. We obviously want to allow in each building is, is, is different. For when we're assessing a real building, we want to start with what the actual building you know, is. consumption is yeah. and, and match that on a monthly basis. And then, again, it's given very good confidence when we're proje projecting the savings that they're, they're represented. Um, and uh, just related to that, then, is is there any rationale any longer to look at the SIBSI benchmark data if the pathway to zero carbon is 51% less than 2016 to 18? by 2030. I mean, should that become our kind of new benchmark? Uh, yeah, like, I, I think so. I mean, even within the SIBSI benchmarks, there are, the, like, there are typical buildings and good practice buildings within those as well, going back to sort of 2010. We benchmarked ours against typical stock because we were looking at it as a 30-year-old building, really. But to say, well, we are looking at a real building, we just start with the average of the 2016, 2018, that becomes our benchmark, and then we look for the 50% reduction against that yeah, So it's just a common, it's a kind of a sense check at the beginning, you're, yeah. you're using SIBSI. And the final one is, it came back there with the district heating and so on, um, the challenge I'm finding a lot is it's very easy to get the electrical savings uh, on, on, on track with the benchmarks because it's just changing IE2 motors up to IE4 and all that type of thing. But the thermal is a real challenge, and especially with older buildings. And a lot of our public sector stock is very old. So take this building, for example, like if I wanted to take the gas pipe off this building, okay, there's the electrification of heat. It's a brilliant idea. So I go off and get my heat pumps, air source, or ideally ground source or water source. But before I can do that, I need to have my water coming out of 50, 50, 50, 60 degrees Celsius, not 80, which is what the rads would normally be in most of the older buildings. And rather than retrofit the whole heating system, the rads and everything, I just want to really change the beginning of it to, to make it electric. But there's, So what I'm getting from it, is it true to say that for anyone who's asking now for, you know, to get the cost optimal even for the older stock, 
you really have to go fabric first. So you have to look at the at sealing the building as best you can, replacing the windows with double glazing, triple glazing, putting external or internal insulation if you have to. So that's a huge price tag item. But is that the reality of the situation? Or is, is, is the phased approach you mentioned earlier kind of accommodating for that? And the passport, so to speak, is allowing to a degree for that. Uh, it's a bit, still a bit confusing that. Thanks yeah, very much. Well, look, there's a mix of, again, of solutions. So uh, certainly in some building applications we're looking at, we are you know, improving insulation, reducing air leakage, replacing glazing. And that then is allowing us to operate at a lower um, water flow temperature from a heat pump. However, what's happening against that is the heat pump technology is improving as well. And really, the main improvements is allowing higher temperatures of operation. So there are CO2 heat pumps now that can operate at 80 degrees C. So in other cases, then, we are you know, using heat pumps at that temperature. In other cases, we're adopting a phased approach of replacing gas boilers that we use a combination of heat pumps at lower temperatures uh, mixed with boilers that retain some of the boilers that were there previously at higher temperatures, which is allowing us to maintain the, the system operation. So again, it, it really depends on a project by project basis. There's a, and I think just, just like David's example there, there's a really good point in terms of how much you're going to get from the fabric from one building to another can change drastically. And if you look at, like, I suppose the, the whole element of the smart building technologies and, and all those things are, are a huge element. And the idea of the bivalent system, so you're exactly what you said about just being able to deal with something right at the end. Like in the UK, it's become a little, uh, quite prevalent now where they put in a standard heat pump and they put in a, an electric boiler, which sounds really onerous. But when you actually look based on a compensated circuit, how, how, how much of the year your heating system actually has to run over 55 degrees. It's a really low margin. And then if you put on the other side of the balance sheet what it would take to change the whole fabric, you know, so, so for, the whole, for, the, so for that, that other 5%, you can run at 55, you know. So these questions need to be asked. And like the, the SSRH that we spoke about there, that's one of the major changes with the heat pump grant that's on that now. So there's no longer a minimum requirement on your fabric to receive that grant. When you can prove, once you prove you know the reality of what the heat pump will cost you to run, once you've done a cost-benefit analysis and, and you show you're happy, then we're happy to, to give it to you, you know? So, okay. One more question here. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, great presentation, everybody. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm trying to improve my knowledge, you know, every time, you know, and, and renewable energy. I found, you know, most of the stuff here, you know, being new to me as well. And um, going back into the industry, um, I found that most of the people are not aware of, of the stuff we are talking here, you know. And uh, I must admit, you know, for Sean uh, here from Symphony, that this is, this is something new for me as well, you know. Uh, and and uh, information is everything. On a personal level, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to lead by example, you know, and, and to, to do all this stuff that we are preaching, you know, out there uh, on my own uh, um, personal level, you know, in the house and um, renewable energy, solar panels, heat pumps, you know, I have everything. I have an electric car. And, uh, but now, coming to Sean, and it will be the, your uh, question for you there, it's, it's all about information. You know, it's, it's not enough to have all those systems installed, you know, as long as they don't communicate, as they don't uh, talk to each other, you know, and you don't know exactly. So just recently I installed some sensors, you know, to, to know the level of consumption that I have, you know, and I have a little bit of PV production, you know, and it's frightening, the discrepancy, you know, between them. And probably because it's Ireland, you know, probably because there was very little sun in the last couple of weeks, but there is a huge gap over there. So. This is, this is your approach or your ideas that you're coming with, you know, to kind of close that gap with information, mm. to, 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 to gather that information, you know, and probably uh, uh, use, maximize that, that solar PV energy, you know, into, into heating, into, into cooling and, and so on. So if you can talk um, with, uh, told us about your approach, what exactly, if I have a, a real building, you know, to give you today, 
what do you do to, to achieve those three, three pillars? In your um, okay, what, what, to, uh, what type of building are we talking about? Is it an office? It's or an office. It? It's an office. Office yeah. building. What, what do you do? do you, that involves a kind of um, a physical um, adjustment to the uh, heating ventilation system. It varies. So um, it, it's an engineering engineering exercise first. So our, our actual background is in consulting engineering. Um, I was 12 years with Arup, and then we set up our own firm in 2006, consulting, and then moved into the energy side. So it's worth kind of bringing the design into the actual sort of uh, implementation and then the, the optimization. Um, so the approach would be to, to review your systems that you have in detail um, and then look for where um, the larger plant items are being driven by smaller nuances in the demand side, which may require small uh, improvements or, or, or modifications physically to your equipment. Um, in the newer buildings, typically not. Um, but in the older buildings, some modifications, some small enhancement, rarely the kind of the deep retrofit type stuff we're talking about. Um, so we make those changes to sort of smarten up what you got. So we, what we try to do is we try to sweat the assets. You know, typically when a building owner is coming to us, they've really done all they can um, or they don't have the money to go to the next level and we can kind of get them to the next level or even beyond in, in, in a sort of a short payback manner by using it in a sort of a, a smart how engineering how approach. Um, Again, depending on what, how much physical is involved. In, in, I suppose, in our fastest turnarounds, we're talking about three months to do it. Uh, three months to do it, and then we have maybe a month of what we call fine tuning, and then 12 months of verification. Because what we do is so out there that our clients don't believe we can do it, so they won't pay us unless we perform. So we have to have the baseline beforehand. At, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, so the piece. <laughs> that's it, exactly. So that's it, precisely it. So people find it's too good to be true. So we have to make it into an energy performance contract, and they only pay for what they save. And then when, when we say a billion saves amount, a certain amount, it's because the client has signed off on it and they've agreed to it that that's the case. Um, but the, the heat recycling piece in the middle, that is just a that is just phenomenal what it's doing in terms of giving essentially free air conditioning for the largest part of the year. And then we work with that on the other two pillars. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just th thinking differently, thinking holistically, thinking counterintuitively where necessary, and then piling it all together with a thorough approach. Um, it's not just to come in, copy, paste, smack bam, smack bam, you're done. It's each building ha takes an engineering lift. It's that gap which is not on the construction team. We've got your design team, you've got your, you've got your construction team, but you don't have, and you, your control contract will implement whatever is given from the design specification, but who's actually doing the heavy lifting to connect it all together, and that's missed. So we come back, we retrofit that into buildings, but as I say, we can bring it forward in the earlier stage of buildings we're invited to. We could have, I mean, it depends, but norm normally, like, if there's more physical works, it might take six months. We rarely go past nine or 12 months. So this is quite a quick turnaround. And then the pillar in the bet between the, the heat recycling, we, we outsource that. That can be done by other contractors. They don't need us to go with it. They just go with the IP that we have. Yeah. Right. Brilliant.